Buy my novel, Escape from the Village, from major booksellers online. Go to escapevillage.com. Subscribe to my Substack. Go to fountainheadforum.substack.com. Thank you. Welcome to the party, pal. This is Fountainhead Forum 87. Uh, I have Eduardo Marti, who is with the Fundación uh, Responsabilidad Intellectual, uh, which is the Foundation for Intellectual Responsibility, I guess, uh, in in the uh, wonderful country of Argentina. He's uh, He's been working with them. He's also been with Junior Achievement. Uh, he's worked with various objectivist organizations in America, and we are going to talk about uh, what has been one of my favorite topics lately, Javier Mille. How are you, Eduardo? Very well. Thank you for the invitation. Happy yes, to be here with you. Yes. Well, first question is... Uh, how did, how did you get into Ayn Rand? Uh, because I went to Grove City College to study under yes. Hans Senholz guide. And Who? he was announced, Hans Senholz. Oh, you yes, know, Hans Senholz, yes. Ludwig von Mises had three very good students at NYU. One was Murray Rothbard. The second one was Israel Kirchner. Yes. And the third was Hans Senholz. Hans Senkos was a former pilot from Germany, from the uh, Hitler movement, and his, his, his plane was shot down when he was 26. And uh, he was sent to, he was captured and sent to a prison in the south of New York. And after the war, he decided to stay, he was released and he decided to stay in, uh, in the States and he uh, decided to follow his PhD at NYU with a German professor that had been invited by Leona Reed to part to work at NYU as a visiting professor. That was Ludwig von Mises. Yes. So when he ended his PhD, uh, because of an arrangement between Leona Reed and Howard Hughes, you know, the, the aviator, Howard Hughes, the millionaire, Yes, Howard uh, Hughes, yes. Millionaire was a very, uh, the Howard Hughes was a very good sponsor of Grove City College. Oh, wow, school. I didn't know that. Yeah, and because of that, because of his influence, Hans Engels was appointed to, uh, as the dean of the Department of Economics at that university. Yes. Um, and when uh, uh, Benegas Lynch, who was after the... Uh, Revolución Libertadora in 1956. That was a revolution that kicked up, kicked out Perón from power. So Mr. Benegas Lynch was appointed uh, at the uh, Argentinian embassy in Washington. He met Leona Reed. Leona Reed was the founder of Foundation for Economic Education in Irvington on Hudson, New York. Yes. And Leona Reed was printing the Freeman was printing socialism, human action, uh, economics in one lesson of Henry Hazlitt, uh, Frederick Bastiat, and Mr. Benegas Lynch and Leona Reed become very good friends together with Manuela Yau. Manuela Yau founded Universidad Francisco Marroquín in Guatemala. Benegas Lynch founded the Center for Studies on Liberty in Buenos Aires, and Leona Reed founded Foundation for Economic Education. Uh, Benegas Lynch invited several professors, invited by Leona Reed, to Buenos Aires. The first one in coming was Ludwig von Mises, who gave six lectures in Buenos Aires that became a very famous book of uh, Leona Reed. And also, Hans Senkels was invited to Buenos Aires by, by, because of the influence of Ludwig von Mises. When he came to Buenos Aires, he decided to give a scholarship to one Argentinian student each year. The first one in going to Grove City was Alex Chafuen, who became the president of Atlas Economic Research Foundation together with, uh, with, uh, with Fisher, with Anthony Fisher. Uh, the second one was myself. I went to Grove City, and after that visit, I... Uh, taught at the University of Buenos Aires, teaching ocean economics. 
But one of the students in my class was always arguing with me about objectivist values. I was explaining the subjective theory of value, and this guy insisted that values were objective. Of course, you have your subjective values, but he kept arguing. And I found him very interesting. So they had a little club, and I invited them to share my office to meet with them once a week. So they were translating The Virtue of Selfishness. That was the first book, Ayn Rand book, translated into Spanish after Atlas Shrugged that had been translated by the Spaniards, but with some censure. The, 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 the sex parts and just some arguments against the church were just forbidden in that book. So when we started the movement in Argentina, we translated The Virtue of Selfishness, and little by little, we decided to uh, organize some lectures to inform people about Ayn Rand. That was uh, probably in, I was 30 years old, now I'm 70, so it was 40 years ago. And little by little, uh, the objectivist movement in Argentina was just uh, improving. We also helped the Brazilians to get in touch with Ayn Rand. And Ayn Rand right now is a very popular name among the intellectuals in Argentina and Brazil, the liberal libertarian intellectuals. She's not very well understood. The, most people just know some arguments, uh, but they really didn't, uh, didn't read her carefully to understand the basics. It's not an easy philosophy if you really want to go deeper. You see, you need to think. And that's a difficult task. That's, yes. that's the way I got in touch with Ayn Rand, through these guys. Yeah, that, that's a that's a great story. Uh, you know, there were some other people at, uh, you know, at, at at Grove City. You know, Matt Kibbe was there and Peter Betke was there and uh, Robert. I met Peter Betke when, when I was at Grove City. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's a bit. Yeah, Grove City was certain. I, I, I was I was not aware of the Howard Hughes connection to Grove City, though. That's uh, yeah. And, and that, that's interesting, too, that Howard Hughes was actually, you know, doing doing what he could to promote capitalism. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. He's always been one of those people that uh, there's always been a fascination with Howard Hughes in America. I think it's because he hung around with a lot of these uh, Hollywood people. But yeah, so just just wondering, are, are there differences, say, between uh, when, when Ayn Rand gets translated into Spanish, are there different Spanish translations? Like there might be a Spanish translation in Argentina, a Spanish translation in Mexico or Spanish translation in Spain. Are those different or are they all the same? I would say that most of the uh, Ayn Rand books were translated here uh, uh, in Argentina by uh, an editorial called Grito Sagrado. Yeah. Grito Sagrado in Argentina is liberty, freedom. And um, and was, her name is uh, Rosa Pérez. And uh, we got together with her son, Freddy Kaufman, and we discussed the idea of translated Atlas Shrugged, a second version after the Spaniard, because the, the Spanish version was censored and was not good. So we printed Atlas Shrugged, after that the Fountainhead, after that with the Living, and all the Iran books, Capitalism, The Unknown Ideal, uh, The Virtue of Selfishness, The Romantic Manifesto, Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology. So all those books were printed here in Argentina. And we also managed ourselves to send the books to Mexico, to Paraguay, to Uruguay, Chile. So now you can find all the books around. The Brazilians, they printed their own books because they had to translate them into Portuguese. But uh, yes. the rest of the books, uh, the origin of the books are here in Buenos Aires. Okay, that's that's great to know. Uh, so yes, yeah, so uh, so you know we, we you know we want to talk about Mille. Uh, what 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 do you, what's your assessment of Javier Mille? Uh, how how long have you been paying attention to him? What 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 do you think he's? I think I, I met him in nineteen and in, in two thousand and eighteen. Uh, 
through Rosa Peltz. Rosa was the lady who printed the Ingram books. So he, she invited us to have lunch with Javier. He, she mentioned Javier as a young intellectual. He was teaching economics at the Universidad de Belgrano and also was, uh, uh, he, he was an econom, eco, eco, econometrista. The guys who build models to, talk to, to, to try to, to make forecasts about the, the future prices of different commodities, etc. So he loved to use mathematical models, by, but little by little, he started to discover the importance of capitalism in the process of wealth creation. So he read Mises and he read Benegas Lynch. Benegas Lynch's son, the son of a man who created the Center for the Studies on Liberty, yes. uh, wrote a book called Fundamentos de Análisis Económico. And it's a short version of human action. So he read that book and he loved it. And after that, he read Economics in One Lesson. He read Bastia, uh, uh, Economic Harmonies. And he started to read whatever he could or related to Austrian economics. And he loved the new ideas. And uh, he was working for a group that uh, hold the airports in Argentina and also the some TV cable news. So he started to be to receive invitation to discuss economic uh, uh, issues on those TV shows. And his personality, because he's so emotional and he's so, uh, he's a little bit aggressive discussing, and uh, he became very popular. You know, the fascist spirit is in Argentina, 40% of people coming from Italy, and they all came during the time of the Duce. So mm -hmm. you see the people in Argentina is very emotional. They love to follow a leader, and he has that leader personality. He has that aspect of, of the, his personality is very emotional, but also he's very solid with arguments and arguing. So he become very popular on the TV shows. He is a kind of actor, so he knows how to address the different audiences and how to seduce them. So uh, he, little by little, and he learned how to refute very sophisticated arguments in Austrian terms. Uh, after that, we got in touch during all these years, just visiting each other or just traveling together to give lectures at the interior of the country. And also, um, I gave him several books. I gave him explaining postmodernism from Hicks to him, Nietzsche and the Nazis. And also, uh, I think I had my little influence on him, in especially with Ayn Rand, and that's why he oh, he mentions Ayn Rand pretty often. He, I think, he only read some chapters of the virtue of selfishness, and uh, I, and uh, but he has a kind of sense of life. He's an individualist. He's in favor of capitalism. And that's very innovative for Argentinian standards. They are all collectivists. They are all part of a tribe. So Javier Millet is not. And I don't know if he really understands philosophy. He's a little bit mystic. He loves to read the, uh, the Bible. And uh, he's a kind of Ronald Reagan in that way. So yes. he, he's... He has his uh, he has his aspect of uh, a mystic aspect, but I think he's a kind of deist. He's the kind of man who looks at God as an architect who created the universe, and after creating the universe, he rests. Uh, he he just stayed aside, so he left human beings to use their brains and their reason to just. To understand the world. He's a very emotional guy because he suffered a lot when he was young. His father used to beat him and uh, when he was 16 he beat his father back and uh, 
he knocked him out. So the father expelled him from the house. So he went to live with his uh, grandmother. And uh, so he's a rebel. He was a goalkeeper in a soccer team. And, uh, and he, he's a self-made man. He started to work young. He was a very good student as an economist. And when he discovered Austrian economics, that probably was six, seven years ago, he really uh, loved it and knew how to defend the arguments against the fascist and the socialist. And he is very aggressive. We did the same for years at the University of Buenos Aires with focus groups, etc. And we were pretty successful, but in short quantities of people. The Millet phenomenon is that he is addressing just poor people in poor neighborhoods. And because of his personality and the way he delivers the message, he is attracting them. So in the last election, he won. And I think he will win the next election in October and he will become the next president. He is a kind of guy, because of his strong personality, he doesn't allow any other personalities to grow up near him, you know? He's the kind of guy he likes to command. So I don't know if he will be able to organize teams to help him to run the country. So let's see what he can do. Right now, what he did, denouncing the political, uh, the political uh, gangs to denounce the unions, to denounce the empresarios, the businessmen who are, uh, approach the government to make business with, with the government. So he denounced all that and uh, he's in favor of reducing public expenditure to uh, uh, reduce taxes uh, to... Um, it's full of regulations, Argentina, more than 70,000 regulations. He wants to stop that. He wants to open trade. So he wants to close the central bank in Argentina, stop inflation. So most of his initiatives are very good. So that's why I support him. I want him to win. And I think that uh, he's going to have a chance to change the country. Right now, the country is broken. One hundred and 25% of inflation rate per year and 45% uh, of people in poverty. And uh, so the situation is really desperate. And uh, the country is broken. Nobody is lending money to Argentina anymore. Interest rates are just very, very high. Business is very difficult to organize in Argentina. So I think that he has an opportunity to really improve the situation of the country. Yeah, it sounds great. Uh, you, you certainly sound very optimistic about him. Uh, you, you, you've told me some things I didn't uh, really know about in his younger days. Uh, Alberto, I had not heard of Alberto Benegas Lynch uh, before I started talking about Mele, but it sounds like he's been a very important figure down there. Uh, and definitely, you know, and certainly it's a great, you know, that he worked with Leonard Reed and Hans Senholz. Uh, my, 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 I went to the Foundation for Economic Education back in 94, so I definitely know who Hans Senholz and Israel Kirzner are. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I've been trying to get Kirzner on here, by the way. I know he's over 90, but I mean, he's, he's the last person who got a PhD under Mises who's still alive, so I'd love to have him on here. Uh, if yeah. anybody... Although I, although I don't know if he's able to come on, but it'd be great to be great to have him even just for five minutes. Mm. Uh, nice guy. I met him back at FIA 94. Uh, uh, yeah. Who are you talking about? Uh, Leonard Reed or who? Uh, no, I'm talking about Kersner. Ah, uh, Israel Kersner. I know, mm -hmm. I know. Yeah. yeah. He's, he's very old now. Uh, yeah. I met Leonard Reed uh, when he was yeah. in his 90. The first seminar I went yeah. to uh, FIA was uh, with him. And we were a group of people from all Latin America. He put us all in a room without windows. He turned off the light and he kept us in obscurity for five minutes. 
So we, we all thought he was a little bit mad. And uh, after a while, he came back with a light, thermostat light, and he started to just little by little to enlighten the room and uh, asking us, what are you looking at? And we were answering, Leonard, we don't see anything. Just a little light. Okay, you want to change the world. I'm, I'm teaching you how to do it. So little by little, he turned on the light and he said, you need to become lights. You need to become interesting people or the people go to you and ask you, uh, ask you questions about the state of the world, the state of morality and the state of business. And so the only way to do it is that you become enough attractive to have your own audience. So in order to do that, you need to learn and you need to read. That was Learn and Read. Yeah, lot, lots of great people at FIA. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so uh, that, that's where Mele is. Uh, you know, you've talked about him being rather emotional. Uh, you, know, you know, you also talk about he, he doesn't, you know, he does quote from the Bible. Uh, do, you, do you think it would really be possible for somebody to get elected to any office in, in your country who is openly atheist? Or do you think maybe he just has to quote the Bible now and then to engage in window dressing? I think that he really, he has a mystic aspect. He lives with five dogs, the, yeah. those huge dogs. And he, when the, the first dog died, he cloned him up. So the four sons, uh, they, and he talks with the spirit of his dead dog. And he likes, he meets regularly with uh, with uh, a Jewish uh, rabino, rabbin, I don't know how you say that in English, and he's his uh, a spiritual advisor, and he several times he speaks about the Bible and some passages, etc. Though he's very rational too, when he needs to argue and to give you arguments, he knows the arguments and he knows how to do it. So. He's a little bit altruistic because I don't think he knows how to refute the altruistic ethics, but at the same time, he defends capitalism, individualism, and I think he's going to win the election for because he's explaining why necessity does not create rights. And that message is just the contrary message of all the rest of the politicians. He's telling you, you have the right of the, for the fruits of your labor. You have the right to your life. You have the right of your own happiness. So uh, he's, he's the only one speaking about individual rights. And at the same time, he's against social justice, redistribution of wealth, and uh, he's against equality. He speaks, uh, he defines equality as uh, uh, the idealization of envy. So the way he argues, he argues in moral terms. And I think that's why poor people are voting him, because they see something real and honest about him. Is he going to succeed? Is he going to be able to change a country that for the last 90 years has been in decadence. We don't know, really. We don't know. He, it, this is a country full of mafia people. You know, we have uh, and the church. We have Bergoglio, the Pope, uh, Pope, Pope Francis Pope. And he's an altruistic. He's a Peronist. And he's spreading out the wrong message, not only in Argentina, but all around Latin America. So all... Yes those values are in all Latin America. So in order to fight that, you need really to be very courageous and you need to change values of the citizens of Latin America. Can you do it in four years or eight years? You see, living in a country like the States, where you have Benjamin Franklin and you have John Adams and you had uh, uh, 
Thomas Jefferson, and and you had so many beautiful intellectual heroes, and still is not very well understood the capitalistic message. You have Obama, you have Joe Biden, and you have and they are just mixing up arguments. So you have a kind of social, and you have Harvard, and you have all the intellectuals there. So it's not so easy to win an intellectual battle. And that's why you are fighting, Chris, right? Yeah, yeah, we're fighting an intellectual battle, you know, Eduardo. And, you know, and, and you know, I think you're older than I am. You know, you know we, we, we saw the Berlin Wall come down. We saw the dissolution of the Soviet Union. I mean, I haven't, I haven't talked to anybody who thought that, we, that, that socialism would be more popular now than it was when the Berlin Wall came down. Yeah. You know, you know, we, we all thought it was dead and buried and maybe that was part of the problem is we got kind of lazy, but, uh, you know, it, it's, it's alive and well, in fact, it's doing, it seems to be doing better, you know, better now than it has been. Uh, you know, you know, you've said that, you know, Mises and Ayn Rand are popular among the, uh, free market intellectuals, but what is the overall intellectual state of South America? From what I've heard, it's very bad. What you have is the influence of the church and the Jesuits yeah. has been very determinant. Yeah. Most people think they believe in the message of putting the other cheek. Yeah. Or they believe in the idea of that it's more difficult for a rich man to end, go into heaven than for a camel to pass yeah. through the uh, of, of an eagle. Uh, so that message of poverty... Yeah. And uh, the idea of altruism that you need to sacrifice for your fellow friends and citizens and brothers, the Comte idea, the Kant idea, is all spread out around Latin America. Yeah. Most people think they are part of a tribe and they belong to the group. So the idea of that if the group needs you, you need to sacrifice your life for the state, for God or for whoever. So in Argentina, uh, in the last 20 years, we have been preaching individualism and capitalism. And I think Javier Milei is the consequence of that spreading out of ideas. So it's the consequence of years and years of teaching at the University of Buenos Aires, small, small groups teaching the importance of being yourself, go for it, Impos I touch a junior achievement, the wealth, the wealth creation idea, the American values of go for it, impossible is nothing. Just do it. Think big. Something that you take for granted there. But we touch with junior achievement. We, I founded junior achievement here and for 30 years to 1 million students in Argentina. We did that also in Brazil and in Chile and in Paraguay. So and with the Ayn Rand ideas, we started also 10 years ago or 15 years ago, just spreading out the books. And little by little, you see the incipient movement of objectivism. I would say that most people are still Keynesians. They are still Kantians. They are still, they believe in the state. They believe in redistribution of wealth, social justice, etc. But when you see Millet beating them, on, in an election day, you see that in a way, in some ways, some other ways, you see that there is a change and you see some incipient movement in favor of freedom. And that's very encouraging. That's, that gives us hope because you see that when you fight the intellectual battle in the right way, you start to receive some good feedback. So, if is Millet going to going to be able to change Argentina? I really don't know. But what I can tell you is that it's the first real attempt. If he wins the election, it will be the first real attempt to change things. So let's see. Yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, you know, it's uh, you know, I often think that you know the Bible comes from a time where almost everybody who got rich got rich by stealing. And I, and I do wonder, I, I always qualify with that, that there wasn't really any type of capitalism as we know it today. Right. Uh, and, I, and, and you know, and, you know, I also like to think of the, you know, the, you know, when Jesus says, you know, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, but, you know, don't, but 
but you know, give to yourself what is yours. So, so I, I, I don't think Jesus was necessarily anti-capitalistic at all, uh, but but certainly I can understand why some people would would use that to be to be socialist. Uh, well, when he went to Francis, it's horrible. I agree with that. I agree with you that probably at those times you didn't have too many yeah. entrepreneurs and capitalists. But at the mm -hmm. same time, the message when he goes to the temple, people selling things, and he tries to separate uh, the idea of selling things in the church with in the, in the, in the temple. Uh, I don't know about that. Probably, I think his idea of uh, commerce and trade. I don't know if you are familiarized with Antonio Escojotado. He wrote three books, three books about. Uh, the Enemies of Commerce, and it's a beautiful recount of history <coughs> in Spanish. I don't know if this translated into English, but the history of commerce, and it starts with the Greeks, and you see the kind of rebellion against commerce uh, all around the world by people who love power instead of just getting your money through trade. Yes. So I, I don't know. That can be the case, yeah, yeah, yeah. Antonio Escojotado. Esco H O Tado. Yes, Esco yes. Esco Tado. Antonio. I'm, I'm the enemies of you. commerce. Three volumes. Yes. One book. Three volumes. Yes, I know. It's a. Well, it, it's just been you know tragic the way this this Marxism has infected the world, and it's really infected South America. You know through. Through group through organizations like the Sao Paulo Forum, yeah. uh, you know I, I've also heard that you know that Castro and the the communists there are actually helping to fund some of these other revolutions, and that Hugo Chavez got a lot of his education in in uh, a yeah. lot of his uh, training under Castro and the communists in Cuba, and, and that they consider Venezuela. Let me interrupt you, Chris, telling you this: there is another yeah. man called Loris Sanata. With Z double T, Sanata is an Italian Lord. university. Sanata, C A N A T T A. Oh yes, okay. And he explains that after the reform, and because of the discredit of the church, the Catholic Church, the last refugee for the Catholic Church was Spain. And of course, Latin America, that was the second house of Spain. So <laughs> most of the, the, the last resort of Rome was Madrid and was the capitals of in Latin America. So you yeah. see all the influence of the Jesuits and mostly the ideas of just anti-capitalism were spread out all around Latin America. So the, that, that anti-merchant spirit comes from that, that idea yes. of the big government redistribution of wealth to be your brother keeper, that all those come from the church, regrettably. And mm -hmm. so the alliance, between, Sanata wrote several books showing you like Castro, like Chavez, Perón, Maduro, and all the Latin American caudillos, most of them killers and, uh, and robbers, just came from that same school of big government. And we need a leader to avoid the excess of capitalism, to redistribute wealth, to help the poor, etc. And if you see Bergoglio and in, in, in Rome right now, Pope Francis Pope, and you see the kind of people he's attracting, and his message is very coherent. He's always defending socialism. Yes. In Argentina, he's a Peronist. Yeah. Well, you, you know, it was something we realized long ago. They they never objected to the communists for their communism. They only objected to them because they were atheist. Right. But now they're trying to make you know make Marxism with a, with Jesus, and yeah. uh, I'm curious to know how they reconcile that because. With the fact that Catholicism is still quite Aristotelian, uh, well, you have that. Uh, you have some schools like the School of Salamanca, 
Yes. And you have the spirit of capitalism, like Michael Novak and some other ones. In Argentina, you have Alex Chafuen, and, and he's, run, he's running the Acton Institute. And the, the, they made a lot of effort yes. to reconcile capitalism and religion. But in general, they are losing that battle in general. And you see with Bergoglio, the idea of uh, they, all the encyclics, except just one or two, uh, the documents coming from the church, they are very, very strong anti-capitalist. Yes. So, and if you ask me what, if you ask me which has been the most in, important influence in Latin America uh, regarding the hatred for capitalism, my answer would be the church. That's number one. The second one, of course, are the intellectuals. And the intellectuals, you have all the postmodernism in France, uh, Foucault, Derrida, Lyotard, all the German school, the Prussian school has been very strong in Latin America too. Kant, if you go to any Latin American school, who's the main philosopher? Immanuel Kant. And you have Comte, Jean Manuel Comte, also como uh, a strong figure. And you have Nietzsche, and you have Heidegger, and you, uh, you have uh, uh, Lakatos and Feyerabend, and all the all, all the all yes. the all the French school though. So that's what is being taught in Latin America. So it's not surprising that that idea of just the Foro de Sao Paulo really you had agenda in Chile, you have Perón in Buenos Aires, you have uh, uh, Evo Morales in Bolivia. In Paraguay, you had a fascist leader of the same style, the Stroessner, for 30 or 40 years. In Brazil, you had Lula and you had the other ones. Uh, Lula is still very strong. And you had, yes. they, they took and destroyed Venezuela. They took and destroyed Cuba. Cuba was the number one country in Latin America, was still wealthier than Argentina. And they managed themselves to, 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 to destroy a beautiful country right now is, if you go to Cuba, I don't know if you've been there. It's a complete disaster. No, it's very it's still very difficult for Americans to go there. But yes. Yeah. Well, maybe not as difficult as it used to be, but I mean that's and and you know that's one of those things. The the embar you know it's a sixty year embargo that's un accomplished absolutely nothing. It really just gives them an excuse for the failures of socialism. Mm -hmm. And you know, I I I I I have been to Colombia. I've been to Mexico quite a few times, and I've been to Peru. Yeah, yeah. you so, need yeah. to come to visit us, Chris. Yeah, uh, you know, you know, one 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 event down there that's happening down there in November is the Latin American Bitcoin Conference is in Buenos Aires. So yeah, that's actually quite tempting. Not to mention, I'm also tempted to go down there sometime, possibly just for all the natural beauty. Uh, well, let me know, Chris. If yeah, you can, so maybe, we can organize something for you. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about about going. I'm, you know, if I maybe I'll go as, about as far south as you can go and see the natural beauty. Uh, you know, get to, to see Patagonia. some. Yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. You know, I I I did ask. You know, how, how far north do the penguins go? Uh, I, yeah. I've heard I've heard they I've heard they go pretty far north. Well, yeah, you you have the three Patagonian provinces: four, Sierra del Fuego, uh, yeah. Santa Cruz, Chubut. Yeah. And you'll find the penguins there. Yeah, you can go to Antarctica too if you want. <laughs> I'm not going to go. I don't know. Really cold. And you need to take a crusher. And the seas yeah. down there are very wild. So if you go from Tierra del Fuego to Antarctica, it's going to be tough. You need to have a very good stomach because the seas are wild there. Yes, I've heard that. And, you know, it's, it's just it's just miraculous to think what these men like Magellan accomplished. Yeah, uh, uh, back when they had ships that were much, uh, much more vulnerable than the ships amazing, we had today. Amazing. Yeah, uh, and of course they had no radios; they had nothing like that. It's nah. like, it, it really is amazing to think about what they accomplished. And, and yeah, 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 amazing. Uh, you know, you know. Uh, so, yeah. So you've been interesting. You know, well, I had one person on here, and he said that basically, Melee was using. Peronist methods to achieve libertarian ends. Do you think that's fair? The message, the way he speaks, the, may, the, yeah. the way he shouts, the make he yeah. he's, a, he's a rock star. So yeah. he's using that. 
But I think that Perón, Perón was very immoral. You see, he was a thief, was a very resented man. And I think that uh, I believe Millet is an honest man. And at the same oh, yeah. time, I think that he trusts what he speaks. He, he's, he's been honest. So, uh, and his mental capacities are much longer than Perón's. Perón was a demagogue, a populist. He adored uh, Mussolini. Uh, he was sent. He was at the at the, uh, the militaries at the yes. time. He was sent to to Italy to study, and he was fascinated by the Duce. So he became an admirer of of, of Hitler. Uh, of course, yeah. when he was in power, he uh, allowed the Germans Nazis to come to Argentina, and. Uh, was a, a refugee, a, a refugee for, for them. So uh, I think that Millet is a very honest man. He's an individualistic. His sense of life is proper. Is good. Yes. Uh, he is a little bit nervous. He's a little bit. His state of mind is not peaceful. So let's see what he can do, and he's able to build teams to support him. But. I would say that is the first real hope for Argentina in 100 years. So uh, let's see if it works. Let's yeah. see. Well, well, one thing you've also pointed out, it, it sounds like Mele really doesn't stop learning. I mean, he's still educating himself. He's still learning about free markets. Uh, you know, uh, uh, does he have any other allies? I mean, uh, I, I mean, one person did tell me that he was uh, friends with Maria Karina Machado in Venezuela. Uh, you know, how, how does he compare to some of the other uh, other heroes in, in Latin America? He really got involved very much with some no nationalistic uh, yeah. movements and also some very conservative movements yes. at the beginning, especially those who he is against abortion and uh, he is in favor. He he doesn't speak too much. But he is not very much in favor of homosexuality or gays, allowing gays to get married. He doesn't mention that, but he's, he's, the way he surrounds himself in general has been people who defended the militaries during the 70s, that were fighting the guerrilla, but at the same time, they committed a lot of excess. They didn't have any respect for, for human rights, etc. So... At the beginning, his alliances were just the militaries and very conservative and religious groups. But yes. I think that little by little, he became more libertarian. So right now, he's more respectful to gays in general. In abortion terms, he said that what he doesn't want is the state to pay the bill of a lady who wants to uh, practice an, abor an abortion on herself. So he moderated his, uh, his his work. He still wants, in economic terms, he's very rigid and he's, he's in a good way. But uh, in social terms, I'm less conservative than him. And uh, we fight him. We, 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 yeah. we fight him when he deals with that. But I trust him that he will become a more open mind guy regarding yeah. social issues that uh, in economic terms, he is very good. Yeah, of course, you know, what, one thing we've learned, though, is, you know, voters don't care about social issues when they're worried about whether or not they can put food on the table and make their house payments. Right. I mean, it, it, it really is, you know, those really are the things they're most concerned about. And then when, when they don't have to worry about those things, they start to yeah. worry about other things. I think that if Millet managed himself to open trade, Argentina has been a very protectionist country yes. with industries that are very, very inefficient. So textiles are very expensive here. Uh, uh, cell phones are very expensive. Toys are very expensive because they are being produced by cars are very expensive. So because they are being produced by very inefficient firms. So. Yes. The pressure not to open the border, not to allow people to trade, is very strong coming from those empresarios. So if he managed himself to open trade, the unions, to stop the unions, 
and to allow free contracts among employer, employers and employees, that would be very good. And to shorten and to, 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 to cut public spending, that would be very good. So I think that yes. he might ask himself to do that. Argentina has some pretty good chances to improve. Yeah, you know, when you talk about labor unions, uh, you're, you're mostly referring to labor unions in, say, private companies, right? I mean, in America, almost all of the labor unions are government employees. We don't have many private sector unions. You're referring to private sector unions, right? Right. Okay, I, I just want to clarify that. Yeah. Although, although the government unions in America are a humongous lobby, and they lobby for a lot of things that are obviously, well, they're all a bunch of socialists, basically. And Yeah. Uh, that's the case here too. They are fascist, kind of, uh, yeah. and, and they uh, they got their funds through uh, as a kind of tax. Most firms had to pay to uh, give money to. If you have an employee, you take money from that employee, being an employer, and you give it, give it to the union. So it's uh, it's mandatory. You don't have. If you make a hundred a hundred uh, bucks, they take five for the union, and the employer is forced to do that for the union. That's by law. That's amazing, you see. So they are all rich. The corruption is inc incredible, and uh, of course they don't want to stop that. And Millet is suggesting to stop that. So, of course, they are against Millet. Yeah, they're against Malay. Yeah, uh, you know, you're you're very optimistic about him winning the election. Uh, yeah. What, you know, what kind of uh, dirty tricks or things do you think they'll try to pull? Because obviously, you know, they're you know he he got thirty percent of the vote in the in the primary, but that also means he he didn't get seventy percent of the vote. About so, what do you think yeah. they'll try to do? Do you think they'll try to unify against him or or what? No, I think that the. Uh, I think that he, the real quantity of votes he got were around 35 percent, but because he didn't have fiscals to control the votes the, uh, in areas that were poor in general, they stole him another five points because he didn't have enough people to control the veracity of the votes. So uh, I think that uh, the second one, Patricia. Is very libertarian too in general terms. It does. She doesn't have the knowledge, Patricia Bullrich, but they. She probably is in favor of Millet. If so, if they once one of them win, Patricia <coughs> or Millet, I think they will have an alliance to govern, and I think is both together can have sixty percent of the votes. So I think that uh, that's going to be very good. I think that Patricia will help Millet to have a good government. But I think that Millet will win because he's using the arguments of morality and Patricia is not because she's a kind of social democrat. So I think that uh, I think that Millet is going to win. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's good. Yeah. So uh, one, one thing else too, though, once he, what does he do once he wins? I mean, is he going to have a, you know, have a, a Congress or a, a chamber of deputies that's opposed to his policies or, you know, is he going to be all by himself or is he going to have allies? You know, uh, what Bukele did when he got his the presidency in El Salvador, yeah. uh, I think that uh, he managed himself. When you see that a president is, going, is being successful, a lot of deputies change areas and they go with the leader with the new leader. So I think that's going to happen in Argentina too. I think that a lot of Patricia Bullrich deputies will move to towards Millet or will help him to govern. And if not, I think he will be submitting some uh, referendums to get the population involved to back him, his reforms. But I think that he will try to cut spending immediately, at least from 45% of PBI to 35, 30. And in probably if he makes another presidency, another four years, 
he will try to get to 20 percent. Argentina really grew up a lot at the beginning of the century with 10 percent of public spending. You know, in the Scandinavian countries, 40, yes. Europe in general, 40, 45, 50 percent. So the countries just stopped growing. Argentina stopped growing 20, 30 years ago with the public spending expenditure of 45 percent. So in a country that is not attracting investment, so with the, that amount of public spending and corruption, of course, the country doesn't work at all. It's really in very, very yeah. poor condition. I think Millet will cut expenditure. Uh, Millet will try to balance the budget. We will try to close central bank, dollarize the economy, or at least to allow yes. different currencies to do that, to favor free contracts in labor, uh, lower taxes, um, deregulate the economy, um, fr prices will be free. So I think that most of the subjects, when you, when you just go step by step and analyze all the issues, I think it's pretty libertarian. And he read the good part of the library. So I think he has some background to argue. He's very good arguing. When you see him in public discussions, they don't want to argue with him. Not only because he's yes. aggressive, but also he gives good arguments. It's not easy to refute. So Yeah. You know, it's not very often that we end up with an economist who can go in, who, you know, who can go into a, a, you know, a lecture hall and debate the PhDs yeah. that also can go out onto the street and talk to the people working out in the street. I mean, yeah. if you can, if you can do both of those, that that's really a, really a skill that two skills yeah. that you don't see come out very often. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've talked about it, you know, a lot of these economists, they're great. They're great economists, mm -hmm. but they are just plain boring. And, yeah. and, and one thing, you know, you cannot do as a candidate, you cannot be boring. And it's definitely something me is not doing here. You yeah. know, another thing too is you know we talked about him. I've heard also that he's the, that he's got a, a girlfriend who's an actress, and maybe that's had some influence on him. And that he's, and you know, also just you know we got you, you can't talk about Mile also without talking about the look he has. He, he's definitely got a look that is you know unique. You know, he is very honest, and yeah. people like that. He was asked about his sexual life, and he confessed that he. Okay, He's 43, 44, he's single. He got in trios, two girls and him, two boys and a girl. He uh, he confessed that openly, and people were shocked, like in a conservative Catholic country, a guy who says, yes, I practice trios. Then uh, he, he didn't give too many details, but he says, if this guy is confessing that openly, in conservative audiences, and uh, uh, he probably is honest in any other subject. He's not lying, and people value that. So I think that, in a way, crazy things that in the mouth of anybody else would be condemning for the rest of the of his life and going to hell. I think in his mouth, he's open, and he he says he speaks always about respect of your own project for life. So if you want to do whatever you want with your life, you can, but don't enter into my sphere of rights because don't try to tell me what to do and try to impose me uh, certain behaviors because if you try, if you do that, I will defend myself. That's, those are his arguments and people bought that. And I think that he did a very good job criticizing the politicians, explaining how they really benefit from this system of redistribution of wealth, social justice, etc. So he showed how immoral they are. And the, the way he's going to fight that is reducing the size of the government. So he's going to have only eight ministries. We have 20 now. So from 20 to eight is a very good improvement. And he did that in all the subjects. So people people really believe him, trust him. So I think that has that has been very good. 
Yeah, yeah, it has been very good. And, you know, I think maybe if you can be open and honest in a way that doesn't really scare people, he's kind of found the what I call the sweet spot where he's not really scaring people, but he's exciting people. Uh, you, know, you know, it is true. You know, Eduardo, I, I've got to say, I, I look at South America and I really see it as the best hope for Western civilization out there. Mm -hmm. largely because, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I, I'm certainly, you know, a, a civil libertarian, but I, I still see a you know, I still see countries generally where marriage is taken seriously and where families are taken seriously. Yeah. And, and the West has completely abandoned that. Uh, or, or most of the, you know, the more modern West has completely abandoned that. I mean, you know, if, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, this is why I think, yeah, you know, you're kind of you're kind of at marriage and family where it was in the in the 1950s here, and I think if you can just get your corruption cleaned up, you'll you'll really do well down there. Uh, there there is some possibilities. Yeah. Yeah. We need really to. Yeah. The, 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 uh, you complain about the state in a way that probably the situation yes. of uh, yeah, that's true too. But at the same time. Your individualistic spirit is still there. Yes. The idea of that you need to reward people because of the effort and because they really, uh, your hero is still Steve Jobs. Our hero yeah. in Latin America has been for decades Che Guevara. So I think that's a big advantage you have. So yeah. your, your morality is still in favor of yeah. entrepreneurship, of just, yeah, I, and in Latin America, the morality has been altruistic, that idea of sacrifice. So yeah. it is true that we have family values. It is true that we are still, but we need to combine your sense of life in favor of capitalism, yeah. in favor of, with our good familiar spirit of good convivence. And I yeah. think that that combination would be fantastic. If yeah. we manage ourselves to preach that, I think that we could live very better lives in, in our future and uh, to improve Certainly. the situation of this part of the continent. Yeah. Well, well, you know, I, I, you know, I think that's part, that's part of what, you know, I realized from Ayn Rand and, you know, also from Isabel Patterson, what made America so powerful is, is we've had so many innovators whether it yeah. be Steve Jobs or or Howard Hughes or or yeah. or Benjamin Franklin or or Nikola yeah. Tesla or yeah. or or Thomas Edison or just all these people who did creative things and got in some cases they got rich some cases they didn't but some cases they just got famous but uh, you know and I, I I think to a certain degree we still have that although I'm afraid we're going to lose that but you know, you know I can't I can't really think of that many. Latin American entrepreneurial heroes are just, you know, great inventors. And, and I, I hope that changes because, it, you know, if you have a culture where people admire that, but it, well, it, it is I unfortunate, you know, you know, sometimes, you know, that Che is, che, do they have Che on t-shirts like they do here in America? Well, you you know, in, in, in Argentina, it's probably the country in Latin America with, with more iconos, uh, Entrepreneurs uh, yeah. that build firms with one billion dollars, they they yes. sell, and uh, most of them right now they are not in Buenos Aires. Yeah. They are in Montevideo, they are in Sao Paulo, they are in Madrid, yeah. or they are in Miami. They move yeah. because they are being persecuted for being successful, taxing them. And oh yes, so if Malay wins, they will be back, I think, and yeah. that's going to be a big improvement. But what you said is really yeah. in the states. You know, if you are uh, if you are Elon Musk or if you are I don't know you you got your rewards and you are recognized yeah. and people follow you. They can criticize you like Zuckerberg yeah. or whatever, but still you are a very important citizen of the country and you are being yeah. asked how you made your fortune. Yeah, you know, and, and you know sometimes you know. Uh, you know, and, and to a certain degree, you see that, I mean, you know, when I go to Mexico, I'm always impressed by the, what I call micro businesses that I see. I mean, 
a business that you could maybe start for a thousand or two thousand dollars. Like right. somebody has a little trailer just selling tacos. Another guy had a little business where he was just making keys for people. Yeah. Or or a restaurant or a restaurant that maybe has only five or six tables where they're just selling food. I mean, I mean, that's one thing I've noticed. I don't know if you see that in Buenos Aires, but you certainly see that in Mexico. But you know, but you know, I, I found it interesting, you know, when I look at South America, for example. There are hardly any railroads in South America, which I think is is tragic. I mean, rail railroads would be great, especially for the rainforest, because it's a good way to travel, you know, in the rainforest. Uh, and, and you know, I, and I can't really think of any big American car company in South America. You know, yeah. it's, you have this large market, but you know, instead you have to ship all your cars in from somewhere else, or at least. Well, in, in Argentina, we have seven car yeah. factories. And okay. We have Ford, we have uh, Chevrolet, yeah. and we have, uh, I would say we have all of them. Okay, that's and great. But, but you don't have your own, though. You know, you don't have your own native Argentine company. That no, makes no, we had one, but no, most of them are foreign. We have Volkswagen, we have all the okay. Japanese, Toyota, and the other ones. They produce the cars in Argentina. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, uh, I would say that. Uh, yeah, uh, but our main products are the industry of uh, food. Argentina yeah. can feed 400 million inhabitants in oh, the yes. world, like Ukraine. Our pampas are very fertile, but yeah. when they export grains or meat, they are being taxed for almost 70% of what they got. So yeah. if you have a big government that is absorbing all that money, so all the industries derived from the agricultural aspect that could be feeding the world, they are just small. Mexico, yeah. with the president of Mexico being a socialist, also you have all those micro firms that could grow a lot and become multinational, yeah. but they don't be, because of the persecution of big taxes and regulations on the market. Oh, yeah. So uh, the mentality of anti-capitalistic mentality is very strong. Yeah. Chris, I'm sorry, but I have another interview in 10 minutes. So okay. if you don't mind, I'm ready to answer your last question and to tell you okay. goodbye for the, maybe a yeah. next one. It's been great. So what, what would you like to say before we go? No, I just, I want to thank you, Chris, okay. for just paying attention to Latin America and our changes here. That's fantastic, Chris. I think that you, yeah. you're interested in learning more about Latin America and our future is very, very healthy and help us a lot. And uh, if you send me a copy of this interview, I will promote your, your yes, show here in Argentina and all the neighboring countries. So you yes. can become a popular uh, a journalist here yeah. uh, in our media. The rest is I'm at your disposal. Whenever you want to discuss any subject, please call me and let me know. And we will organize another meeting. Uh, well, it, it's really been great, you know, and I, I have a lot of interest because I, I guess maybe it's because I'm not very optimistic about America, mm. and I and I certainly don't mind having to learn Spanish. You know, <laughs> I, I learned, you know, it's a language that's spoken by 400 million people, and I, I, I love, I, I love the attitude there, uh, you know. So it's a uh, hopefully things will go well, and you know, maybe I'll maybe if I get in better shape, I'll try to hike up on Concagua, but uh, you know, okay. but anyway. Good, good. Yes, uh, Not very high, yeah. almost seven thousand meters. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. It, well, I'll have to get in better shape because I went to Bogota two years ago, and going that high just about killed me. So, yeah. But anyway, uh, it's been great talking to Eduardo. Uh, please follow the channel, like the channel, subscribe, uh, like the video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe to my, my Substack, and buy my novel, Escape from the Village. Thank you, Eduardo. Muchas Thank gracias. you again, and have a great, great day. And Thank you. Are, uh, yes.